Lola. I think this is the most interesting problem that I have had in a while. So we have a real value function f uh, defined on a, an interval that uh, well part of the real numbers, and it's said to be convex under uh, this condition uh, for every x and y that belong to the intervals defined in and for every lambda between 0 and 1, I have to prove that every convex function is continuous. I think it's a very interesting problem. Uh, I grabbed it from a Harvard qualifying exam, I think it was from 2007. It was the second problem, so uh, let's begin with actually solving it. Uh, so, first of all, let's do some uh, juggling overall on this inequality. So let's begin by expanding stuff out. Here we have uh, lambda x plus y minus lambda y. Less than or equal to lambda f of x plus f of y minus lambda f of y. Yeah? Okay, now I'll probably factor lambda. We have uh, y plus lambda times uh, x minus y less than or equal to. No, it's nice to get lambda uh, outside, so let's grab this and transfer it to the left hand side. And uh, here we can factor out the lambda entirely f of x minus f of y yeah? cool now if you were to look at this uh, this really resembles the uh, well limit definition and we would be able to apply this but issue here is that we don't have the absolute value sign here on the left hand side and if we were to do that, then uh, we're making an assumption. Because if this is negative, then issues arise, because the inequality wouldn't be like this, right? It would be with another sign. So how do we go about it? We say that uh, this over here is either positive or negative. Let's begin with the positive part. We're gonna say that it's not really positive. Let's say that it's uh, non-negative. Greater than or equal to zero. That's nice. Okay. And as for negative, what we're gonna do is uh, f of, uh, oh, I will not write this all out. I just copy paste it. Uh, less than zero. Now let's review it case to case. Uh, for the first case, we can just write it out directly. We can grab this, say that uh, this is true for every lambda. that lies within this interval. Now, thing is, uh, to use this as a limit, so we can say that we're taking the limit as uh, y. Okay, no, as uh, c approaches y of f of c. And this would basically be it. Uh, let me explain why. I will write it down more rigorously after. So essentially, with this lambda over here, we're uh, approaching just regular y, and x minus y is gonna be, uh, well, it's gonna be a constant. And f of x minus f of y is also a constant, and as you can see, it's decreasing with uh, lambda decreasing. Approaching zero, too. So uh, now let's try to scribble down the uh, epsilon delta definition of a limit here. Uh, 
essentially uh, for every actually no let's do some basic notes first first of all let's say that uh, f of x minus f of y is a big a yeah we're gonna use it as a constant Next, let's say that x minus y is also a constant, let's call it uh, big B. Now let's rewrite that. f of y plus uh, lambda big B minus f of y is less than or equal to uh, lambda capital A. Okay, cool. Uh, now we're gonna, well, try to form this into a proper limit, right? So we can say that uh, for every epsilon greater than zero, uh, first of all, I'm gonna limit it. Uh, I'm gonna say greater than zero and uh, Epsilon has to lie. Okay, no, let's write it like this. So lie from zero to capital A, yeah? Uh, reason I'm doing this is to, well, confine it into this part. So we can say that lambda A yeah, is basically epsilon. Why can I do that? Because if we pick epsilon greater than A, yeah, then for delta we can simply pick delta from a lesser epsilon. So this part here is okay. Yeah? I could write it down a little bit more rigorously on why this works, but uh, video is limited. So uh, now that we know that down, there exists a lambda from zero to one, so that uh, epsilon is equal to lambda a. Yeah? Okay, now. We have here is f of y, uh, f of y plus, now we can represent lambda with uh, a and epsilon. We can say that lambda is equal to epsilon over a, so epsilon over a times b minus f of y. Yeah? Yeah, so less than or equal to epsilon. Now again, less than or equal to. It works for real value functions. I'm not gonna write down rigorously why it works, but essentially what you can do is you can just divide the epsilon by 10, then get this for this epsilon over 10, and then return to the regular epsilon and say that the delta for epsilon over 10 works here. It's just, I don't want to bother with a lot of rigor since it's like more of an entertainment video. So, uh. After this, we finally get, uh, well, this nice statement. So now we go to Epsilon. Uh, now, if we were to look at capital B, uh, capital A yeah, is implied to be positive, or well, rather not negative, but uh, capital B is not necessarily non-negative, so uh, what we have here essentially is uh, literally the fact that uh, delta exists and, well, for every epsilon that lies on uh, from zero to capital A exists delta that is, well, equal to uh, b over a times uh, Epsilon so that f of y plus delta minus f of y is less than or equal to epsilon. Okay, cool. Now that we have noted the down, uh, what does this imply? Yeah. 
So this implies that uh, the limit here is gonna be okay, the limit as c approaches y of f of c is gonna be equal to well f of y. But again, we made an assumption here that is the first case. So what I'm gonna do for the second case is I'm gonna try to uh, return him back to the f first case. Okay, so uh, second case. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say we have x2 and y2. And the way I'm gonna do it is I uh, wanted to find x2 and y2 in such a way that y here becomes this and this here becomes y. So uh, y2 is obviously gonna be y plus lambda times uh, x minus y. Now we're gonna bring down the x second and uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna plug it into a nice equation. We're gonna take this part and we need to replace it with uh, y in x as 2, y2 plus lambda x2 minus y2 is going to be equal to uh, regular y, yeah? Okay, nice. Now there's going to be y plus lambda blah blah blah. We can cancel y on both sides. Get uh, lambda x minus y plus lambda x2 minus y2 equals 0. We well, can divide everything by lambda because we know that it's not 0. Uh, x minus y yeah? plus x2 minus y2 equals 0. And finally, x2 equals uh, y2 plus y minus x equals, now let's look up, uh, 2y minus x. Uh, and then what we have is plus uh, wait a second. This way too, so I grab it. Okay, yes. Minus x plus uh, lambda x minus y. Yeah? Nice. So now we can plug those x's into the equality, and what we get is f of y yeah? minus f of. Uh... Okay, let me scroll up y plus lambda x minus y yeah? is less than or equal to lambda times uh, f of x2 okay let me go back yes f of x2 minus f of y2 and now I think yes this is gonna be basically well, we can take the absolute value with no trouble because this is going to be positive. And now we can just, well, uh, swap the f of y and f of y plus lambda x minus y easily, since it's under the absolute value sign. No, not sign, you know, absolute value function. You know what I mean. Okay, now... Now again, uh, we can simply replace this with a capital A, yeah? In a similar manner. This is capital B in a similar manner. Capital B, less than lambda times capital A, yeah? And what we get ourselves uh, is... Uh, the same damn thing. So we'll return here because 
we have already solved this case. And it indeed suggests that, well, a function being convex is uh, inherently implying that the function is also continuous. That's it for today, yeah? I hope you liked the video because this problem was uh, tough to crack for me personally. I spent a lot of time on it. I think it's a really interesting one. It was from a Harvard qualifying exam. Eh? So uh, that's it for today, yeah? Bye, yeah?